There's a, a part of this song that you're, you're probably going to recognize. It just says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Because Christ is enough, no matter what happens, I have decided to follow Jesus. And there is no turning back because we have seen time and time again that Christ truly is enough. So we're going to sing that song today and celebrate that as a church. So I'd invite you to participate. Um, this is not just, we don't want to just be singing and, and playing up here, but we want this to be um, a joint effort where we're just praising God for his faithfulness and who he is. Um, so let's celebrate that truth today that Christ is enough.
Amen. Well, we are so glad that you've chosen to be here and to declare that truth that we have decided to follow Jesus. And that's what we're about here today is just a bunch of Christ followers gathering together to declare and praise the name of Jesus. And so we are glad that you've chosen to be here. Why don't you take a second and greet some people around you, tell them it's good to be worshiping with them this morning. Good morning. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see around the room today's a, a special day, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Um, there's all kinds of decorations around here, Texas Rangers. Uh, this is Courtney, my wife. You know, I told uh, Kirk, we're more A&M fans, so we would appreciate the A&M balloons rather than the Rangers, but uh, th this will do. But, um, yeah, gig them. That's right. Uh, now we're worshiping. Um, but, you know, today's not about anyone on the stage. It's not about the Rangers. It's not any particular person. Uh, we've gathered here today to praise the name of Jesus. And so we're going to do that as a church. And we're going to sing this song that says, Great Are You, Lord. And um, that it's your breath in our lungs. And sometimes, it's, you know, we you fall into this trap of thinking that we can do things on our own. And that uh, we get into this mode of self-sufficiency. And, you know, we just can't do this life on our own. I mean, let's just be honest with, about that. It is the harder that we try to do things on our own, the more we fail. But the good news is, is that Jesus Christ came and died on a cross and rose again so that we could have victory in this life. So that we could stand and sing, great are you, Lord, at your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise because he's worthy. And so as we sing this song, let's make sure that we're giving him the praise that's due to him. That when we sing, great are you, Lord, at your breath in our lungs, so we call out your name, we cry out your name. Let's make sure that we mean that, that we're singing that um, with authenticity and that the life that we have in Christ is so evident in the way that we're worshiping, that we're not just singing songs, but that the living God that's active in our lives, that we're singing to him. So let's sing this song together. Shout your praise. 
worship, I just wanted to read from Colossians 1 uh, as it talks about the preeminence of Christ. The next two songs we're going to sing are particularly just about this and just exalting Christ and just uh, singing together who he is. And this passage just always encourages me in worship. It says, uh, he, is the invis- he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Yeah, we just want to center our hearts and our minds on Jesus this morning. Um, on the divinity of him and the power that just comes through his name and just speaking his name. And we're just going to be encouraged to go out and share the gospel and to be ministers of, of the Spirit. And um, I just think that sometimes we try to put too much pressure on ourselves and not just put it on Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so as we go out and minister and are encouraged today to do that, um, I just feel that we can all just be encouraged to remember that we can put it on him and his word and what he said and that his word brings boldness and his word transcends our hearts and it penetrates deeply and so we just lord we just lean into you and your power and your might god we don't um, save you save lord and um we are confident in you and confident in what you can do through us lord thank you for letting us be a part of your story god we just want to lift you high
Clap our hands this morning and praise God for that. And God, we do, uh, we do just want to declare, God, that we're here for you, God, that, that you are our cornerstone. And as we sing this song, um, Lord, we're just so thankful that we have a firm foundation in you, God, that you um, are the cornerstone that we can build our life upon. And we know that nothing that happens in this life, God, uh, can conquer you because you've conquered everything, God, and you proved that when you um, sent your son Jesus, who walked among us, who lived a perfect life, died and um, proved that you were Lord even over death, that you were Lord over sin. And because of those things, we can come together today, thousands of years later, and declare that you are still the cornerstone that we choose to build our life on. So Lord, I pray that we would sing this in spirit and truth, God, that, that we truly would, even when we walk out of here on Monday morning, God, that, you, that we would remember you are still the cornerstone. It's not just on Sundays that you're the cornerstone. We got that you're the cornerstone that we daily choose to build our life on, that we daily choose to put our hope in, that we trust for our sanctification, God, that we trust for our salvation, and that from this day forward until you call us home, that every single day we will live as people who choose to have you as our cornerstone, and that that would draw the world around us, the lost around us, that there would be something different about us, that they would ask, what is it that you put your hope in? What is it that you... Um, are longing for one day, and we would see that we were, we were living as, with you as our cornerstone until the day you call us home. So I pray that we would sing that um, in spirit and truth today.
His righteousness alone. For the sin. for all you've done for us. Lord, help us to just to just be with you still as we continue to um, hear and to learn. Lord, we love you and just want you to be uh, present over all of this. God, um, we give our hearts to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, that was some good worship right there. Amen. Amen. Woohoo. All right. Man, thank you, Matt and Courtney and Ben for leading us in worship. Well, I've had the privilege now for nearly 11 years, and this is a privilege beyond measure to be called to be the pastor here at Stillwater Community Church. And uh, we have been privileged to see God do miracle. That's all right. You're good, bro. You need to untie yourself. Now you're gonna drum, he's going to drag the drum set right off. The... <laughs> really, we've seen miracle after miracle over the course of these last few years. It's been amazing to watch God's hand at work. And we've seen countless people, young and old, come to faith through the work that God is doing here at Stillwater. We praise him for it. We've seen this take place at summer camp like just two weeks ago. We've seen this take place at VBS like just three weeks ago. In our children's ministry recently, we had a young girl profess faith in Christ. We've seen it take place here in our worship services at special events. Uh, last fall, we had a wrestling event at our fall fest and saw several place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We even have a guy here who... Uh, Gave his life to Jesus at Walmart during the tornado. Praise God for that, right? God has drawn people to himself. Um, this, it's just been such a joy to watch people make decisions to follow Christ and to, to be a part of that. A couple years back, we had a July 4th celebration down on Main Street. And there were several of us, and we were under a tent, and we just were sharing the gospel the simple message that God loves us and we've been separated because of sin, but he provided his son Jesus to die in our place. And I remember a young man that um, hearing that message and said he wanted to trust Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And right there inside the tent, he prayed to receive Jesus. And that was awesome. But what was really cool was it's just a few minutes later, he brought back three of his friends and said, please tell them this same message. It was fascinating. I guess the thing I want you to see this morning is we have seen the good hand of God here. He has brought credible people into our lives to shepherd, to co-labor, and to build relationships with, to advance his kingdom cause. He has expressed his goodness to us. 
in the way he has supplied for our needs as a facility, just a place to meet. Some of you know this, some of you don't, but we began in a living room of Richard and Denise Pope's home. And uh, week one, he filled that place, and so he provided another place, and we were at the Presbyterian Church on Rowlett Road. It wasn't long after that, we needed a little more space, and God provided Rowlett Bible Fellowship, and we were there. And shortly after that, God opened the door for us to have this facility. We praise God for seeing his hand uh, at work in so many of the details as we've watched him change one life after another, both saving and sanctifying people here through the work of God. He's also provided for our financial needs abundantly, above and beyond what we could ask or imagine, even though all we have is a couple boxes that are carved in the back wall, and we don't speak about it very regularly. In fact, I should probably speak about it more because it is an act of worship for those of us who follow Jesus. We can't help it. We want to give back to his work. But even without speaking about it, without passing a plate and having a couple boxes carved in the wall that people stand in front of and most people don't know they're there, he has abundantly supplied for our needs in such a way that over the last 11 years, we have literally given thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to global missions. We've had work that we've supported in Moscow and in Africa, in Peru, extensive work in Ecuador among the Shuar Indians on the remote, uh, off the river of the Morona. We have, uh, beyond that, we've also been able to uh, currently uh, support Hannah Sharp, who's in India, sharing the gospel, and seeing people come to faith. We praise God for that. Many of you know we're currently hosting the Pakistan church here. We're thankful we can do that. We also supply to the least of these in our community. You'll hear more about that next week, our backpack ministry with Keeley, as we help those young children who are not as fortunate as others of us. But beyond giving thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to global missions, God has also enabled us to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars locally. Uh, the building renovation is part of that, and uh, Stone's on its way. It'll get here soon. Be patient. But we're thankful for where we are. We're waiting on the stone, and the project will continue to move forward. But we're thankful for that. We've been able to do things like our um, Back the Blue Fall Fest last year, gave money to the police in our community so that they can have it for a crisis relief work that they have. We uh, give money to Keeley. We had an Easter egg pancake breakfast thing here. Uh, many of you helped. This fall we'll do the Rowlett Reindeer and other missions as well. The point I'm making is just this, that God has been incredibly good to us as a church. But one of the most gracious things that God has done in past years in expressing his goodness to us is by bringing a young man named Brett Gilpatrick and his bride and then their growing family, both Lively and Canaan, to this work. Uh, Brett has led worship here, children's ministry, student ministry. He's preached, and he's actually grown to be quite a communicator. He's developed our website, our graphics, and a whole lot more. But perhaps the greatest accomplishment that this young man has brought to us over these last several years is he's modeled for us what it means to passionately follow Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and to serve him with the highest level of excellence. For those of you who are guests today, you may not know it, but Brett and Brandy, who served with, with us now for many years, um, have moved to East Texas. They did that this past week. They're now living in White House near Tyler, Texas. And uh, Brett will be preaching next week, so you want to make sure you're here next week for that and bring some friends to hear him communicate truth. But given our circumstances with Brett and his family moving to East Texas, I wanted to send Brett off with a challenge. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about each of you and where does this leave us as a church? So I have a little challenge for you too. <laughs> and this challenge comes from um, a book that Paul wrote. He wrote a lot of our New Testament, 13 books, 13 letters. Uh, but one of them he wrote, one I want to speak from today, he wrote to Timothy. Timothy was a guy who came to faith under Paul's ministry. He wrote two letters to Timothy. One of them he wrote a couple years earlier than the one I want to refer to today. The one I want to refer to today is called 2 Timothy. Perhaps the most personal things that Paul has written in all of Scripture were addressed to Timothy. 
When Paul was going around and preaching the gospel, he went on these missionary journeys and went through places like Antioch and Iconium, Lystra and Derbe, and Timothy was from Lystra. And in one of those missionary journeys, early in Paul's endeavors, he came, Timothy came to faith through his work. And Paul and Timothy became friends. Paul helped him grow in his faith. Timothy ended up starting traveling with Paul in these missionary endeavors. In fact, when Paul wrote one of his letters from prison to the church at Philippi, he says this about Timothy. He says, I have no one like-minded. Everybody else cares for themselves, but not Timothy. He cares for the message of the gospel. It's about Jesus and advancing his cause. The context for 2 Timothy is uh, back in that day, Rome was in authority, um, but it had burned in 64 AD. What had happened was Nero, Nero was the, the ruling emperor, and he had blamed this fire and the destruction on Christians. And so if you were a follower of Jesus, and especially if you were a radical follower of Jesus, like Paul, your life was endangered. Paul finds himself, when he's writing this letter, imprisoned, realizing that the clock is ticking. And Nero's fury is brewing, and that his life is, and the end of his life is imminent. He knows, and in fact, uh, historians believe that probably within a six-month window or so, when he wrote this letter to Timothy, his life was gone. Not long after that, Nero took his own life. But Paul's in prison... Thinking about Timothy, his dear brother in the faith, he calls him his son. And so he wants to leave him with a challenge because he knows his clock is ticking. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of pick up with that and share that with Brett as a challenge to him, to Brandy, and to each of you. And so Paul begins by challenging Timothy to fan the flame. I want to read this to you as Paul writes 2 Timothy from prison with death knocking on his door. He writes, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now it lives in you also. For this reason, I'm reminded, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and of self-discipline. So here's kind of the image Paul is creating. Uh, I'm kind of an outdoors guy, you know, with kids named Hunter and Trapper and Fisher and Tanner. You know I like the outdoors, right? And I've built a lot of fires over the years. I mean, like lots and lots of fires. And Paul uses this image of fanning the flame. Any of you have been in the outdoors at all or built fires, you know what this is like. You take some paper and you roll it up and you put a little kindling and then a little bigger wood and you light it and then, you know, and then perhaps a couple hours later after you've had some wood on it, it gets down to a couple embers, you can fan the flame and rekindle the fire. What Paul is saying to Timothy is that you've been given, through, it was really through the work of Paul, you've been given a gift of the gospel and it's in you. And I want you to think about this this morning because it really doesn't matter where you're at in your spiritual journey. Some of you are at a place where really you once lived on fire for God, but you're down to like just a few little embers. And you're wondering if your faith has any life at all. And Paul would say to you this morning, fan that flame. It's in there. Bring it back to life. Full fire. And say, say you're a follower of Jesus right now and you've been walking with Jesus. You know, you're just kind of, you're going along and your life's okay with him. And you can tell there's that fire of God in your heart. And he'd say, fan that too. Because it doesn't matter where you're at in your spiritual journey. You put a little more air into that thing and fan it a little bit. And there's going to be a little more fury in your fire. And you're going to feel it grow. So if you're here this morning, even a passionate follower of Jesus, Paul would say, fan the flame. And I'd say, Brett and Brandy, continue to fan the flame of the gift of God which is in you. Because he did not give you a spirit of fear. He hasn't put within you this spirit that is, that is reticent or that is cowardly or uh, it's timid. No, he has put in you and he has put in each of us what he calls a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind or self-discipline. The three words he uses here, the first one, 
This idea of power, dunamis, is the same word that's used in Acts chapter 1-8 when we're supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll receive what? Power. After the Holy Spirit comes, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It's that same power. And followers of Jesus, you have been given power. You should not live in fear. Fan the flame. God has given you uh, not a spirit of fear, but a spirit with power and of love. And the word that's used here is agape. It's Christ's love. It's unconditional love. And so you have the spirit of power and you have the spirit of his love. But in addition to that, he has given you, each one of you, a spirit to make really good choices. Uh, the word here, self-disciplined or to be prudent. Um, this is kind of the essence of that, that God's spirit leads you to make good choices. You actually have to resist the spirit of God to disobey and not follow God. You go back to your old default mechanisms, who you were before you knew God. Romans puts it this way, that you were a slave to righteousness, but now because of the spirit, you're a slave to righteousness. You were a slave to sin, now you're a slave to righteousness. That's Romans. You were a slave to sin, now you're a slave to righteousness. And so Brett, fan the flame of that gift that God has placed in you. In church family, you do the same. You have the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. But with this gift, there's two things. It's one is the gospel. You receive a gift of the Holy Spirit. But with that, you also receive a unique giftedness and gifting to be used for the edifying of the body and to bring glory to God. And all of you have been uniquely gifted. Brett certainly is <laughs> uniquely gifted. I mean, how many people do you know that can design graphics, run a soundboard, play multiple instruments, design a web, lead worship, preach with power, lead children, student ministry, and many of those things all at the same time? <laughs> There's just not many like him. He's unique. You are, Brett. You're, you're unique. And you have been such a gift to this place and to the work that God has been doing here. We're very grateful for you. Um, but church family, um, you have been gifted. And we've been talking about this. We were promoting a class called Ignite that we offer here. We had many of you had interest that we're out of town on the 23rd. On August 13th, we're going to have Ignite here. Um, and I want to challenge you that if you're not plugged in, you're not sure what your spiritual gift is, you've never gone through something to help expose what that gift might be and how you can use it in the body for the uh, edification of the body and the glorifying of the Lord, I want to challenge you to come take Ignite with us from 1 to 4 on the 13th of August. We have um, little Natalie Shelby came in this morning and she earmarked a bunch of these books for us. Um, we have them with a little paper clip in them. They're back there in the Welcome Center. And there's a little uh, self-assessment thing that you would do before you come. It's your homework. So if you have interest in coming on the 13th, go back there, get a book. Uh, where the paper clip is, fill out that portion and come to that class with that part filled out. It'll probably take you somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes to do that. And I want to encourage many of you, especially if you have not done this, to join us on the first four or the 13th for Ignite. But Paul says this next. This is what he writes to Timothy. He says, um, you know, after he tells him to fan, fan the flame and you haven't got a, a, a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He says this, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, Paul's writing this, of course, he's in prison. He recognizes because his, his boldness for the glory of God, that's what got him in the, in the, in the slammer. And he realizes that this is really going to be the thing that's ultimately going to bring his death. And he's telling Timothy, man, don't back away. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, right? So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of him. And I'd say this to Brett and I'd say this to each of you. That we need to become more bold and confident in sharing the gospel with people. Uh, I shared this first service. It's a little bit embarrassing to be a pastor and struggle in this particular area. But I confess to you, this has been an area that God has really had to grow me. Even though I, I couldn't sell anything, really, I couldn't sell anybody anything except for I believe this truth. 
about the word of God, that God's holy and we're not, and we desperately need him. I totally believe that. I mean, I believe that like I've never believed anything because it's changed my life and I've watched him transform so many other lives. But I'm telling you, still in conversation, sometimes I find it difficult to be bold and share those truths. And the more and more I grow in my walk with Jesus, the more and more burden I have for people who don't know him, and the more and more I want to share the love about him. And so I'm becoming increasingly more bold and confident in sharing the gospel. And what Paul's telling Timothy, what I'm challenging Brett and Brandy and each of you is do not be ashamed. This is the power of God. In fact, if we're going to reach this community and we're going to make a dent here, God is going to have each of you strategically placed in places where you can share the good news about his son Jesus, who's the life changer. And who this community and neighboring communities desperately need to hear. When we were at camp last week, I told you last week that I sat behind a small group and watched a guy lead a small group. And one of the things he shared with the young men he was with was, he said, how many of you guys have shared your faith in the last month? And I was inspired. I was sitting on this rock watching over this group and over the beautiful river behind them. And several of their hands went up and they began to share stories, these young men, of friends of theirs that they recently shared Christ with. I mean, I was blown away. I'm like, holy cow. One of these kids had a friend that everybody was bullying. He was concerned he was going to commit suicide. He said, man, I just, I saw him at Walmart, felt like God put him in my life and said, hey. He said, I instantly felt burdened for him. And he went up and asked if he could meet with him. And he said, since then, him and I got together and we hung out. I got to share with him about Jesus, invited him to church. I was thinking, oh my gosh. Well, he shared that only 28% of followers of Jesus or less than that share their faith like in the past month. And I don't know where you fall into that, but you would say, yeah, that's, that's true. I haven't. Well, then he went on to share this truth with these young men. And I found it staggering that 68% of the people that they had asked, if somebody came up and shared with you about God and how to have a relationship with Jesus, how receptive would you be? 68% of the people said that I would, I would be at least curious and want to hear what they'd have to share. So get this. There are far more people ready to hear and listen than there are ready to share. And so church family and Brett and Brandy, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Paul goes on in this letter as he's writing. He shares a little bit of his own heart. He says this in 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 11, 12, he says, Of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I believe. I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Until the day he comes, or until the day Paul goes to be with him. He was absolutely confident about that. And so then he writes this. What you've heard from me... Keep us at a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And so my challenge to Brett and to Brandy is to fan the flame and to not be ashamed, but to guard that good deposit. We have spent the last several weeks talking about the battle we're in as followers of Jesus. He wants to seek, Satan wants to seek, kill, and destroy anything about us that wants to follow God. And Paul is writing Timothy, guard the deposit. God brought you to faith. He's put a spirit in you to live out your faith. He's uniquely gifted you to edify the body and bring glory to God in your life as you live it out by faith. Guard that deposit. Protect it. Satan wants to take a guy like Brett and Brandy and create doubt or despair and somehow get them off the path where they no longer want to live their lives and serve the king. And he wants to do the same thing for you. When Paul wrote this, think about this. Pressure started to increase on those who probably professed to be followers of Jesus. And, and so here's what happened. People are going, oh man, those who are living boldly for Jesus are starting to be persecuted. And so some of them started doing this. Kind of like, I think I'll just kind of under the radar. And that began to happen. And Paul knew that was the tendency. He was watching professing follower after professing follower sheepishly walk away from something that they should have been incredibly bold about and unashamed about. And don't let that happen to you because it could. We're living in those days where I, I believe followers of Jesus, bold followers of Christ will become more and more persecuted. I believe that to be true. And so you got to guard that deposit. 
Paul was watching people walk away. Listen to this as he writes Timothy. He says, you know, everyone in the providence of Asia has deserted me. And then he includes a couple guys, one named Phygelus and one Hermogenes. I don't know who would name their kids those two names. That sounds like an epidemic <laughs> in a third world country, Phygelus and Hermogenes. But these guys deserted Paul. They were walking away from him. Everywhere he looked, those who once followed him were now scattering because there was, it was getting a little hot, a little heated. And he says this, May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. There was somebody who was unique in this crowd to Paul. and says, He often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in many, how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. You know, where a lot of people were scurrying and fleeing, this Anessa Forest guy searched really hard and found Paul in prison, wasn't ashamed, and figured out a way to be supportive and encouraging. That's, that's what God wants us to be, that kind of person. So fan the flame, don't be ashamed, guard the deposit. I have two more things that Paul writes here I want to highlight. He says this, he says, you then, my son, speaking Paul to Timothy, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. For each of you, strength comes from the Lord. He's our rock. He's our foundation. He's that strong tower that we run into and find safety. We sang it in the song. When we are weak, he is strong. He's the savior. That's what he does. So Paul writes to Timothy, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And grace, as we've shared many times over here, is unmerited favor and unlimited power and is in ample supply to anybody who humbly calls on the name of the Lord. He is what you need. And um, Ephesians, when we were studying it, we saw this. We we're talking about the battle. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That is where we find strength. Paul found this to be true in his own journey. Some of you will know this. Earlier when, in Paul's ministry, he had what he called a thorn in his flesh. We don't know exactly what it was. Some suspect eyesight. It's really hard to say what it was, but we know this. He went to the Lord three times to ask the Lord to remove this thorn that was in his flesh. But the Lord's response to him was this. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. We're the opposite. We like to see ourselves as strong and not need the Lord or not to call on the Lord. But what he's calling us to is to recognize our weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon us. And Paul writes to that church at Corinth. He said, that's why for Christ's sake, I actually delight in my weaknesses and insults and hardship and persecution and in difficulties because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And church family and Brett, be strong in the Lord. Brandy, be strong in the Lord. That's where you will find your strength. And then finally, not only fan the flame of the gospel and don't be ashamed of the gospel, and guard that deposit of the gospel. Be strong in the gospel. But finally, and I believe the most neglected in the church today, is pass on the gospel. You can imagine how close this presses on Paul's heart. He had committed his whole life from the time God transformed his heart on the road to Damascus. This guy lived full on for God. And he knows he's about to go. So it's in his heart. He's going, man, pass this on. He had covered hundreds of miles, planted dozens of churches, and he poured himself into a handful of people. And now one of those, Timothy, he's going, pass it on. And church, I'm telling you, you know what our mission is. It's reach, teach, and what? Multiply. Multiply. And that is a lot easier to say in here than it is to do out there. 
Because out there to multiply takes time, it takes sacrifice, it takes intentionality, purposefulness, commitment, devotion. The love of Christ is what motivates us to multiply, to pass it on. And here's Paul in prison knowing his days are numbered and one of his apprentices, he's, he's passing this letter on and he's saying, please pass it on. Listen to what he writes. Timothy. He's writing to him, he says, The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. He's just saying, pass it on, man. Pass it on. Invest yourself in a few who will invest yourself in a few who will invest yourself in a few. And I would challenge you, church family, please hear me. Get this deeply in Embedded. This is probably the most stubborn thing that I have said I am not going to depart from until the Lord takes me out of here. He brings somebody else in. I'm going to call us, call you to make disciples. It's not a call to a pastor. It's not a call to an elder. It's not a call to a staff person. It's called to followers of Christ. He says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. That's for each of you. That's not just for me. Too many churches think, well, give that role to the pastor. Let him make disciples. No, it's for each of you. And you go, well, how do I do that, Kurt? And what Paul's telling Timothy is, this is what you do, Timothy. You take those truths that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, those basic truths, whatever God has helped you grasp about him, and then you pass it on to faithful people who then will teach other people, who then will, and it goes on and on. This is not rocket science. Now, here's, here's what it takes. It takes you recognizing this morning that you've been called out by a very good God. He saved you and called you, just like he did Timothy. That the clock is ticking. You only got a short window. Paul feels it. Man, pass this thing on. So here's what I want to encourage you. I want you to think hard, long, pray about this. Who are the people that God would have me invest my life in and share life together with because that's all he's calling us to do. What Jesus did was he grasped a few and he poured his life into a handful of people who then when he was gone, carried it on. And what Paul's doing is saying, would you please do the same thing? Would you please build a relationship with a few people? Spend time in the Word. You'll grow. They'll grow. Train and equip one another to go get a few more, to go get a few more. I saw this at camp. It was so cool. They grasped this at camp. Here's all our students. And here's what they did. They built into the schedule at student camp what they called student-led Bible studies. Student-led time. It sounded like a disaster. <laughs> it was brilliant. They had some truths written down, passages. To, here's the topic. And they took these students from different schools, different ages, and they put them together in a little circle with no leaders. And said, there you go. And all of a sudden, one of those in the group starts the conversation. And then another one chimes in, and another one chimes in. And next thing you know, this student-led group happened. And here's why they were doing that. They were wanting students to realize that they could make disciples, that they could go into their schools and create little circles of friends and open up the scriptures and have, have truth because they have the Holy Spirit in them. Look at truth and begin to see truth and discuss truth and help an iron sharpen iron and help one another grow in truth and that these young people could go and make disciples in their schools. It was brilliant. Day one, it was a struggle. And after they went through the groups, when they got together the next day, those groups just that much easier. Now, if they can do it, and students can do it, and they're called to do it, how about us adults? We're certainly called to do it. You're called to do it. I'm called to do it. So all of you, as Brett is parting from here, him and Brandy, and little Lively and Canaan, 
Uh, we want to affirm our love and faith to you, Brett and Brandy. We really do love you guys. You have been so faithful here. Like a great right hand. Brett is like a great right hand man. He, uh, he gets it done, as you know. Um, many times before he's asked, it's already done. And uh, Brett, we want to encourage you to fan the flame, to not be ashamed, to guard the deposit, to be strong, and to pass it on. And church family, what is good for Brett is good for you. It's good for you. If that fire is almost out, or if it's just burning a little, or maybe it's burning a lot, continue to fan the flame. And don't be ashamed, man. we got the best thing going. We really do. And guard it, because Satan wants to stop it. And be strong in him. In your weakness, he will make you strong. And church, I plead with you, I appeal to you, to reach, teach, and to all multiply. He has strategically placed us here. I believe that. And I believe he's brought who he has here. And I have seen his goodness in this place. And I'm telling you, we're going to have to see it again. We're going to have to see it again. And I have a certain measure of confidence because I've seen God doing this for 11 years. Not me. It's not my church. It's not another church. It's not even your church. Don't refer to it as your church or at our church. It's always what? It's God's church. It's his church. It's his church. And guess what he does? He builds his church. We're excited to see what God's going to do. I will tell you, it's going to take about 20 or 30 of you to fill in where Brett leaves off. Okay? So be willing. Be willing to step up, step in, go through a night with us, find out what your spiritual gift is, let us align you. And we'll divide up the hundreds of things that Brett did into little pieces, and we'll continue to go forward as a church. Before we do go today, I want to, can you hand me that, Martha? I want to invite Brett up, and Brandy. Brandy, can come up too, please. Um, really love this guy. We're going to miss him, aren't we? Yes. We are. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them. A special guy. We're going to have an appreciation afterwards. Okay, you know that. And we're, that's why the Rangers thing. Brett thought maybe we did the Rangers thing so we could just serve hot dogs. Uh, and I, told, I assured him, we're not serving hot dogs because, uh, you know, we're trying to find an easy way out. We're serving hot dogs because of the Rangers thing. So hot dogs and apple pie. Uh, he's a big Ranger fan, and so... I, and I, I'm sorry about that. I, I really feel bad about that. I see One of the things the elders wanted to do uh, and is just to uh, ordain Brett. Is to re and what that is, is, that's basically acknowledging that you can see the hand of God on somebody's life and that they're called to the ministry of the gospel. Like that's what God has embedded in their soul. And so Brett's been very kind to me to let me in on this journey and some of and, and Brandy and what they're doing and praying through and with work and so forth and opportunities. And uh, so we're excited to see how God's gonna use them in that community in White House. But this is just a certificate of ordination from the elders to Brett, just affirming to him that we clearly see the hand of God in his life, that this is a clearly a minister of the gospel. So you give him a hand and we love you, man. We love you. Yeah. 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 That's a good guy right there. Good family. Can I have you stand? Uh, I'm going to pray for us. And then after the prayer, I have some instructions to get ready for our hot dog appreciation. Uh, Lord, we love you so much. And just thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And today is really all about you and all about him. We want to see your name exalted in this place. We thank you for the challenge of Paul to his apprentice, Timothy. And I pray, Lord, that those words that he spoke to Timothy with such passion in, in kind of a crisis season of his life as he realized his window to share the gospel was narrowing. I pray that those words would echo in our hearts. That we would leave with this sense of desire to live boldly for you. 
and to stand strong in the midst of the persecution and the potential suffering or ridicule that we may, we may endure. Help us, God, to continue to pass on the things that we've heard, the things that we have learned, the things that you have entrusted to us. Help us, Lord, to entrust those who, to others who will do the same. We pray your, nothing but your blessing upon Brett and Brandy and little Lively and Canaan. Bless that family. Use them, Lord, in the community of White House for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, hey, here's what we're going to do. Love you, man. Here's, yeah. We do. We appreciate it.